I'll be reading Luke 10, 25 through 37. Luke 10, 25 through 37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed him, leaving him half dead. Now by chance of a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed us showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Good morning. It's so good to, to be here this morning. Uh, the teens and I uh, went canoeing yesterday and, and had a, a blast, and uh, we're very tired, so if, uh, if I fall asleep giving a sermon, no, I'm just kidding, but, but we're, we're very tired. We, we had a great time, and uh, it was good to, to spend some time with, uh, with the teens and, and drive to Birmingham and, and canoe for a few hours and, and then come back home. So we had a good weekend so far, but this morning, let, let's focus our minds on, on things, uh, on spiritual, and let's put all worldly thoughts behind, and let's think about true beauty. And I'm sure you're wondering, well, what are we, what's true beauty all about? And uh, why is that topic going with the scripture reading? Well, it, it all makes sense, hopefully, but, but I really wanted to, to talk about true beauty because uh, I've talked about this topic before and it seems to always still be relevant today. And it really it seems, you know, everywhere we look, it seems the world is telling us how to be beautiful. You know, how to be attractive, how to be wanted, how to be desired. You know, with, with, with fashion statements, every magazine. I just, I challenge you to go to the store, go to the magazine section, and just read all the titles of all the magazines. And, and you'll be surprised. This, it, it's all about worldly beauty. And, and nothing is spiritual about these magazines. Nothing is, is beneficial. In fact, it's all types of beauty that that are passing, that, that, that'll fall away. It's all types of things that are, are almost, if, if not almost, just, are just blatantly sinful and, and not how we should strive to be beautiful. And, and we have to remember that, that true beauty is found within. You know, true beauty is, is not something outward. True beauty is not something that, that others will just look at and say, that's, an, that's, a, beauty, you know, that's a beautiful person. You know, that, that, that's not what true beauty is about. If we're Christians, we're supposed to exemplify Christ. We're supposed to already have that beauty within us, and others can see that by our actions. Others can see that by the things we do, but by the things that, that we are doing for others, not for ourselves. And, and I'm sure you may be thinking like I was at first, but this is not just a, a female issue. You know, the, the issue of, of struggling, you know, why am I not beautiful, is not just a female issue. It seems to be a female issue because of all the statistics we read, but, you know, men just as much as women struggle with an issue of, of feeling like others value them, feeling like others want them, desire them, or, or respect them even. So we're not even just talking about physically beauty as we're talking about just beauty in general. But since we talked about physically beauty and brought that up, 
I've done some studies before, and some of you are familiar with the Dove Evolution. I challenge you, if you haven't seen the Dove Evolution Project, to go home and look at it. It's uh, not the time or place to show that here this morning, but it shows you how, uh, and myself being, uh, I like to do a little bit of graphics, it shows you the amazing stuff you can do with Photoshop. They've done some stuff that's so amazing that they make uh, an, an 80, 90 year old lady look like she's in her 40s by just smoothing off a few pixels and, and doing some color adjustments. And it, it's amazing what they can do with Photoshop today. And, you know, so all these magazines you see have all been photoshopped for hours just for one picture. And we have to realize that, and I also even saw an article the other day, and I'm not sure if it's true or not, so I didn't do my research like I should have. But they say a lot of these commercials, they have people you know, behind the green screens who are advertising hair products or something, and there's a person who's in a green, scene, screen, green screen suit who's flipping hair off of people to make it look like the wind's blowing. And it's really a guy who's behind there in some outfit. So everything you see is a huge big lie. But it's not just a female issue, it, it's an issue that goes across all genders. How can I be beautiful? And we have to focus on the inward part. We have to realize that, that God does not make junk. You know, he has never made junk, he will never make junk. You know, everyone here has been designed and created by God. You know, this Wednesday night series in the summer, we've been talking about, you know, going against evolution, going against atheism and unbelief. And we have to remember that, you know, it is true. You know, God created each and every one of us. And he doesn't make junk. He doesn't make junk. In fact, when he made man, he said that man was very good. If you look at it, if I'm remembering correctly, depending on your, your translation... Everything he was making, he said, and God said it was good. And God said it was good. But when it got time, when God created mankind, he said, God said it was very good. You know, you see, we were created in his image. We were created to be like Christ. So we are very good. We are not, but at the same time, we have to remember that because sin has entered in the world, we have become somewhat stained by sin. You know, I think the biggest lie we tell people is that we are good people. Well, no, we are sinners just like anybody else. The only difference between us and, and others is that we have the truth. The only difference between us and, and the world is that we have forgiveness because we have entered in the blood of Christ. We can become very good. We can become beautiful again by being like Christ, by entering in the blood of Christ. But let's talk about what true beauty looks like. We'll look at six things today, and uh, maybe combine a couple of them. But six things behind me really show you what true beauty is all about. You know, we'll be talking about having compassionate hearts and kindness. We're we'll talking about being humble. You know, having that humility that that is that, that helps us become, you know, beautiful. We have to be meekness. We have to have that meekness spirit within us. We also have to be patient, but, but no one likes patience, but be patient with me when we get to number five, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll be good. And then number six, we have to exemplify love. If we can do all of those six things, we'll truly be beautiful. And I know some of the guys may be thinking, well, I don't want to be beautiful. <laughs> that, that, that's, a, a, that's something to describe uh, females, but we're talking about being beautiful like Christ. You know, Christ's sacrifice was very beautiful. Christ exemplified what true beauty is to look like. And if we're supposed to be Christians, and we want to become Christians if we're not Christians, we have to remember that these six things is all about what Christ was like. So let's look at what compassion, hearts, and kindness would be. Let's go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 10. I want to thank Logan for reading that. It was a long scripture, but uh, it was the, one of the ones that I just chose to, to be read. He did a great job. But let's go ahead and reread chapter Luke. 10 and starting in verse, I believe it was uh, 25. Let me double check. Yes, 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But, to, but desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, Well, who is my neighbor? 
Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. But the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. I'm going to keep that up on the screen for a second. Go and do likewise. Jesus told this, this beautiful parable about, not at the beginning it wasn't beautiful, but this man was beaten, he was robbed, he was stripped of all his clothes, and he was left for dead. And all these people who were supposed to be the, these high people in, in the Jewish society, uh, you know, a priest, a, a Levite, you know, Levites became high priests, you know, so all these things, these were supposed to be the most important people in their religion, in their custom, in their society. And Jesus was using those people to say, yeah, they just walked by on the other side. They didn't have anything to do with this man who, who was half beaten. But then a Samaritan, a group of, you know, somebody that the Jews hated, you know, it, it was, you know, they despised the Samaritans. And Jesus used a Samaritan in his parable to say, this man had compassion. This man showed what true love, what true compassion looked like. We're supposed to have compassion in hearts. We're supposed to have kindness. And this man showed that. He said, which of these proved to be a neighbor? And the man even admitted, well, the one who showed him mercy. You know, he didn't say the Samaritan because he still doesn't like Samaritans. But he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. You know, go and be like the Samaritan in my story. Go and be like me. You know, Jesus was going around healing the sick. He was hanging around sinners. You know, the Jews kept looking at Jesus saying, why are you hanging around all these bad people? You're supposed to be hanging around us. We're the good people. But Jesus said, I I've come to, to seek and save the lost. You know, I've often heard, you know, I kind of look at this like the church sometimes. You know, we tend to, to not want to go and reach out to others because, well, after all, we're better than they are. But that's not a right thought to have at all. You know, the church isn't a hotel for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And, and, we, and we have to start realizing that. But let's go on. Let's also realize we have to have humility. You know, part of having humility is part of having the... the the nature of God, the nature of Jesus. If we're supposed to be imitating Christ, you know, the, the, he, he was humble. You know, he humbled himself. You know, we know that Jesus didn't count equality to, to thing to, to be taken for granted. You know, he was up in heaven. He had everything. He, he lived in heaven. He was right there with God. And then he came down on earth, the lowly of lowlies, was spat upon, was persecuted, was later crucified... The Son of God gave all of that up just so you and I could be forgiven, so you and I could live with Him again. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to your, with, along with me. I know the, the, the verse is behind me, but it, it's so important for us to also use our Bibles, so you make sure I'm telling you what's correct. If you have your Bibles, your phones, your tablets, whatever you have, follow along as we read 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. Peter writes, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, and now it's, you know, everybody, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know, uh, a friend and I were talking, and, and we realized that only in America is the younger generation telling the older generation how to live. Only in America is the younger generation telling the older generation what to do. In every other custom, every other, you know, country, every other world um, society, 
the older generations, the elders, those who have experienced life, those who have understood their mistakes, have learned from their mistakes, they're the ones who are instructing the younger, hey, I've been there before. Only in America have, have we got it flipped upside down. But we have to remember that it says the younger need to be subject to the elders, and then the younger and the older all need to be humble. We have to be humble because if both of us are being too arrogant, well, then nothing gets done. If one of us gets arrogant, then the other despises the other. We have to both be humble and realize, hey, I'm, giving, I'm telling you these things out of love. I'm telling you these because I want to be like Christ, because I want to do what's best for you in Christ. But let's go also look at some of Paul's letters. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. These are some of my favorite verses. Paul says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Now, that's a, a really hard passage to live out. Because, you know, we all like to, to do things that, that make us happy. We all like to do things that are going to benefit us. You know, you ask, someone to do, you, know, you ask someone to do something, one of the first things they ask is, well, what am I going to get out of it? How is this benefiting me? This doesn't help me at all, so why should I even do it? Well, according to Paul, that, that's not a, an attitude to have. The attitude to have is to, to serve Christ, but also it says to, to serve others and count them more important, more significant than even yourself. You know, a great way to remember this, in order for us to have true beauty in our lives, to, to have this true joy, that there's a good way to remember this and just remember the word joy. Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. If we want to have true joy in our lives, if we want to have that beauty, we have to put Jesus first and then others before ourselves, but before, before yourself. And then we can have what Paul's talking about. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. That humbleness, that, that humility we're talking about will really help us have that true beauty in our lives. Will really help us to imitate Christ. When others look at us, they should see a mirror image of Christ. They should say, something is different about that person. Not because of the way we look, not because of the way, you know, we dress, but because, well, modestly, of course, but not because of the, the, the name brand we're wearing, but they, they should look at us and say, this person, he, he acts different. This person really is, is following the Bible. You know, I've heard of many people, and Gandhi has contributed to saying whether or not he actually said it, saying, I like your Jesus, but I don't like your Christians. You Christians are so unlike your Jesus. I want you to think about that. He, now, he may, it's, the, it's debated whether or not he said that, but the statement remains true. He says, I like your Jesus, because Jesus is all about love. He's all about compassion. Hey, there's nothing wrong with what Jesus does in the Bible. But then he says, but I don't like your Christians because your Christians are not like your Jesus. You know, he's saying, you don't act like Jesus, so why should I want to be a part of what you have? You know, we need to be acting like Jesus, and that includes being humble, and, and, and that's really hard. But we also need to be meek. We also have this meekness, which is not what you see on the screen behind me. You know, we, we, too often we act like that when we don't get our way. We act like that when we talk to people who, who seem to not even care, who, who don't want to listen to, to the truth. But we have to teach them in love. We have to be meek. We have to have that meekness with them. It was once described to me that meekness is, is showing anger when anger is appropriate. Because there, is, there are times to, to use that feeling. But it says, but it's also to show gentleness, to show patience when that's called for. You know, Jesus showed patience with so many sinners, but then in the temple he showed that, that righteous anger. Now, now, whether or not we can show that in the same way is, is to be debated, but we have to have that meekness of heart. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6. Paul writes some, some wonderful words in, in Galatians 6, and I hope you can read it on the screen behind me, with me. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. 
Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You know, gentleness and meekness often go hand in hand here. And this is, you know, meekness is kind of the word that is used here. And it's saying that we need to, to restore those who, who are weak. Restore those who have fallen away with, with patience, with, with gentleness, with, with meekness. Not getting angry at them. You know, too often I've seen, and I've had some of my good friends growing up who, who have fallen away. And when they haven't exactly gone into great detail with me, it seems to all stem from when they've done something wrong, they were shown hatred. And, I'm, and that's not excusing their decision to fall away, but it says a lot about the effect we have on others when we don't treat them the way Christ wants us to treat them. You know, we all make mistakes. You know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when others come and, and are caught in, a, in, in any transgression, any, that means not just the little things, but the things that are detestable to our society. You know, murderers, you know, rapists, you know, all these people. It says we should, those who are spiritual should restore them. Now, that doesn't mean that we should take away all consequences, because every sin has its consequence, some greater than others. But it says to restore them in a spirit of gentleness, in a spirit of meekness. That doesn't mean in a spirit of hatefulness, in a spirit of rejection. We're all in this together. We're all supposed to be striving to serve him and helping each other out. Remember, again, the church is not a hotel for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And we're all sinners. We're all trying to find how to serve him better. We're all supposed to be evangelists. Uh, a great minister, a friend of mine, who is uh, much wiser than I will ever be, he, he once said, evangelism is one beggar who found food telling another beggar where he found it. You know, we can't say, well, I'm better because I was smart enough to find it. Well, no, our, our job is to, to help others find the food, find the truth that we have found, which requires a lot of patience. Again, not like the screen behind me. You know, we, we, we can't be like this and have patience. If someone came up to you like that trying to tell you to do something or tell you to fix something, uh, if you were like me, I, I would, my ears are already turned off. Uh, either that or I'm turned around running out the door because he looks like he's going to hurt somebody. <laughs> you know, that, that's not what patience is all about. That's not what, what Christ wants us to be like. Let's go to Psalms 37. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn along with me to Psalms 37, verse 7. It says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. You know, so one of the ways we have to be patient is we have to be patient for him to, to come back, patient for him to, to answer our prayers, because sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, and sometimes he says not now. And we have to be patient for him to even deliver us over those who are evil sometimes. Those of us who, have, who are in a tough situation, we have to be patient. Paul also wrote on patience in 1 Thessalonians 5. Turn over there real quick to 1 Thessalonians 5 in verse 1. He says, Then we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. You know, it's once said that, you know, however strong a group is, is as strong as its weakest member. You know, if, if we have someone who's really weak, then, then it's our job to, to help them, to admonish the idle, you know, to, to those who are being lazy, those who are being complacent, you know, which, which would be those who, who aren't doing their work, those who, who aren't doing their responsibilities in the, in the church, and then for all of us, those who aren't doing everything God has commanded. You know, evangelism is the biggest one I can think of right now. We seem to be so happy in our pews, so happy in our homes, that we're not inviting our friends anymore. We're, you know, we're, and we're wondering why the world is the way it is. Well, it's because we've sat quietly by and never said a word. Encourage the faint-hearted. You know, those who, who are discouraged. You know, 
the elders, the deacons, you know, your ministers, and you know, your teachers. Uh, all of these people get discouraged very easily, and many others in the church as well. We're supposed to encourage them and then help the weak. Again, a group's, you know, however strong a group is, is as strong as its weakest member. You know, help the weak, encourage them, study with them. Uh, I, there was a man I knew at a, at a church that I used to attend who uh, was a new Christian. I mean, now, he had, he had been a Christian for a few years, but he was a very confused individual. He was probably in his 40s. Uh, his name was Brick. Uh, he, he was one of my uh, uh, favorite uh, men I, I've known just because of his, his heart. Uh, if you knew Brick, his life was a mess. Uh, he lived the worst type of life you could imagine. You name, you name any sin, and he's done it. And, you know, to an extent... But, but he used to be in, in, in hardcore gangs. He's been every religion under the sun, including, you know, some, I'm not sure Buddhism, but I know he was Muslim for many, many years. And he became a Christian, and he kept going back and forth, getting confused about things. But he came up to me one day, and, and he said, you know, Jonathan, he goes, no one studies with me. He goes, I'm calling people left and right to study with me, and they all say, well, I don't have time, or, or find somebody else. And, and he had already got discouraged, and people started just acting like he wasn't important. You know, don't do that. You know, help the weak. You know, a lot of times the weak aren't going to ask for help. But this man, you know, he was coming to a building and doing correspondence courses. He, he, had, he lived in a house with no power, would light a candle and study his Bible hours a day. He, he had the heart to study and to do what God's will was, but nobody would study with him. Don't be like that. You know, don't ignore the weak, because if we're ignoring a, a part of our church, if we're ignoring a part of our family, you know, our family is the body of Christ, and if we're ignoring one of our body parts, the whole body is thrown off. And it means we have to be patient with them all. Even if we think they should be able to figure it out by now, they should be able to do this on their own. Well, no, it says to be patient with them. It may take longer to help the weak than you think necessary, but as long as they're still weak, we're still supposed to be helping them. That's what Christ would want. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 verse 3 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There are a lot of those words are again. But we have to have that love. We have to have love in the church. If we're doing everything else but we have not love, as Paul writes in 1 uh, Corinthians 13, we're a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. We're just making noise to make noise. We're just doing things, we're doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons. We have to have love. Let's go to Romans 12 verse 9. One of my favorite verses in, in all of the Bible. It says, let love be genuine. Or some translations say, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. You know, we can't say, oh, I love somebody, but I don't like them. Well, I don't think that works. <laughs> we may not want to hang out with them. They may not be our best friend. But sometimes I think we try to use that way, and then it's not genuine. Our love is not genuine for that person. No matter what they've done to us or against us or to someone we know, we're still supposed to love them. Think about how many times you've sinned and how much God still loves us. And then God says, love as I have loved. You know, that, that, that's a hard statement to do. Let's go to, again, 1 Corinthians. I mentioned this. Let's look at what love is like real quick before we wrap up. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know, without love, we have nothing. Without love, Christ never came on this earth, never died for our sins. Without love, we can never enter in his death through baptism. Without love, we can't help the weak. We can't show compassion to those who need compassion. You know, we, we can't be humble without showing love toward others. 
true beauty is found within. It's not found by appearances. It's not found by the, the name brand we wear. It's not found by anything that we try to make ourselves look like. You know, true beauty from the outside really is fading. But true beauty from within will last forever if it is true beauty. If it is beauty that exemplifies Christ. But again, back to what I mentioned at the beginning, we have all this ability to have true beauty, and God created us to be very good. God created us and said it was very good. He does not make junk, but when we sin, we become stained. When we sin, we are no longer beautiful. But because of his sacrifice, because of the ultimate beauty, because of the ultimate love, when he went on the cross and died for our sins... We have a chance to have forgiveness. When we have put him on in the waters of baptism, we are then washed clean, and all of that filth, all of that, all of those stains have been washed away, and we can become beauty, become beautiful. <laughs> we can become that beautifulness that, that Christ exemplified. But if we are not baptized, no matter what we're doing, if we're, at, if we're doing all of those six things that we talked about and more, but well, we haven't been baptized, then we still are stained. Then we still have that filth from our sin on us. And we can never become truly beautiful until we have washed our sins away, until we have put him on a baptism. So if you're here this morning and, and you haven't done that, if you're here and you, and you haven't put him on in baptism, uh, I encourage you to, to do that now, to, to dedicate your life to him, to say, I'm going to, to strive to, to do the things that I should be doing. I'm going to strive to obey him, strive to, to live for him and not myself, to do those six things, and you will have that true beauty. Maybe you are baptized. You had that at one point, but you've fallen away. You, you've turned to a life of sin again and returned to a life of filth and, and stain. Repent now and, and change your life. Whatever your need is, I encourage you to, to please come now as we stand and sing. to its brink tis the fount of love from the source above and he bids us all freely drink will you come to the fountain free will you come tis for you and me Thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the throne of life now. While the waters roll, let the weary soul hear the call that forth freely goes. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call, fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft, and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me, and its stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me. Thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis 
the fountain open for all.